Overcome by fears and difficulties, I resolved not to continue this work and to use all possible means to adhere to this determination. The common enemy knew my fear and cowardice, and, as his utmost cruelty is more aroused against the weak and disheartened, he made use of this very disposition to attack me with incredible fury. It seemed to him that I was left without help in his hands. In order to conceal his malice, he sought to transform himself into an angel of light, pretending to be very solicitous for my soul and for my welfare. Under this false pretext, he perfidiously deluged me with his suggestions and doubts. He represented to me the danger of damnation and frightened me with punishments similar to those of the chief of the angels, Isaiah 14:12. since I had sought in my pride to comprehend what was above my powers in op in and in opposition to God himself. He pointed out to me many souls who, professing virtue, were deceived by some secret presumption and by yielding to the insinuations of the devil, and he made me believe that in so far as I sought to scrutinize the secrets of divine majesty, Proverbs twenty five twenty seven, I could not but be guilty of pride and presumption, thus being already judged. He urged very strongly that the present times were ill-suited for such matters, and sought to confirm his assertion by what happened to some well-known persons who were found to labor under deceit and error. He reminded me of the dread of the spiritual life in others, how great would be the discredit which would arise by any mistake of mine, and what Ill evil effect it would have on those of little piety. All this I would know by experience and to my regret if I persisted in writing about this matter. And as it is true, evidently, that all the opposition to the spiritual life and the small esteem in which the mystic virtues are held is caused by that mortal enemy. So, for the purpose of doing away with Christian devotion and piety in many souls, he succeeds in deceiving some and in sowing the cockle among the good seed of the Lord. Matthew thirteen twenty five. Thus he causes confusion and obscures the true sentiment concerning it, making it more difficult to distinguish the darkness from the light. I am not surprised to see him succeed therein, as the true discernment is the special work of God and of those who participate in his true wisdom and do not govern themselves only by earthly insight. It is not easy during this mortal life to discern true prudence from the faults, for often also the good intention and zeal warp the human judgment when counsel and light from on high are wanting. I had occasion to learn this in the execution of that which I am about to undertake. For some persons, well known as devout, not only those who loved me on account of their piety and desired my welfare, but also those who were less loving and considerate, all alike and at one time wished to deter me from this undertaking, and also from the path which I was going, as if I was proceeding upon it by my own choice. Their fear of drawing discredit or confusion upon those who were striving after piety with me or upon religion, or my neighbors, and especially upon me, especially upon the convent in which I lived, caused them anxiety, and to me affliction. I was much enamored by the security which the ordinary paths of the other nuns seemed to offer. I acknowledged that this suited more my own insight, my inclination, and desires, and was urged upon me still more by my timidity and my great fears. Cast about upon these impetuous waves, my heart sought to reach the port of obedience in order to reassure me in the bitter sea of my confusion. To add to my tribulation, it began to be rumored about in our order that my spiritual father and superior, who had for many years directed my soul, and who well understood my interior trials, who moreover had commanded me to write the preceding part of this history, who would most likely encourage, quiet, and console me, was suggested for removal to a higher office. The suggestion was not acted upon, but it occasioned his absence for many days, and the dragon took advantage of all this in order to pour out against me the furious river of his wrath, Apocalypse 13.15. Thus, though in vain, he exerted all his malice on this occasion and others to entice me from obedience and deprive me of the guidance of my superior and master. In addition to all the contradictions and temptations already mentioned, and many others not possible to describe, the demon sought to deprive me of my health, causing many aches, indispositions, and disorders of the whole body. He harassed me, he harassed me with insurmountable sadness and conflicting thoughts. He seemed to confuse my understanding, hinder correct thinking, weaken my will power, and sift me in body and soul. And it happened that in the midst of this confusion I committed some faults which were serious enough in me, 
although they were committed not so much in malice as from human frailty. Nevertheless, the serpent sought to use them for my destruction more than any other means, for thus having interrupted the flow of good works, his fury was let loose to cause still greater faults in, the, in this embarrassment by inveiling me to exaggerate my guilt. To this he drove me by impious and most insidious suggestions, seeking to persuade me that all that I had experienced in the path which I had trodden was false and erroneous. As these insinuations, on account of the faults committed and on, account, on, on, and on account of my continual consternation and fears, began to appear plausible, I resisted them less than others, and it was only through the special mercies of the Lord that I did not fall entirely from all belief and hope in a remedy. But I found myself so entangled in difficulties and surrounded by darkness that I may say, the groanings of death encompass me and the sorrows of hell engulf me, Psalms 17.5, inspiring me with dread of extreme peril. I resolved to burn the manuscripts of the first part of this divine history and to desist from writing the second. The angel of Satan who inspired me with this resolution induced me also to withdraw myself from the whole undertaking, to put an end to the pursuit of the spiritual life to neglect my interior life, and not to communicate about it with anyone. Thus would I be able to do penance for my sins, appease the Lord, propitiate Him, and retain His friendship. In order to make sure of the efforts of His concealed malice, He proposed that I make a vow not to write any more on account of the danger of being deceived and of deceiving, but that instead I amend my life, retrench my imperfections, and embrace penance. With this mask of seeming virtue, the dragon pretended to establish his damnable counsels and cover himself with the skin of a sheep, while in reality he acted as a bloodthirsty and devouring wolf. He persevered for some time in this attack, and all alone I remained for fifteen days in a night of darkness, without relief or consolation, either human or divine, without the former, because I was without help and the counsel of obedience, and without the latter, because the Lord had interrupted the flow of his favors, his enlightenments, and continual inspiration. Above all, was I distressed by despair of salvation, and in it the persuasion that death and the danger of my eternal damnation was approaching. All this was instigated and fostered in me by the enemy. But as the aftertastes of his temptations were so bitter, and end but in despair, the very disturbance by which he upset the whole republic of my powers and acquired habits made me more wary of fulfilling anything which he urged on me and proposed to me. He availed himself of the continual fear which tormented me with the dread of offending God and of losing his friendship, and when, in my doubts, I applied myself to works of piety, he sought to draw me away. This very fear, however, made me hesitate at what the astute dragon had tried to convince me of, and in this uncertainty I deferred giving assent to it. My high regard for obedience also, by which I had been ordered to write, and the contrariness of that which I felt in my interior helped me to resist and to recoil at his suggestions. Above all, the assistance of the Most High defended me and permitted not the beasts to snatch my soul, which amid sighs and groans confessed him. I cannot describe in words the temptations, combats, troubles, dismays, and afflictions which I suffered in this battle, for I saw myself placed in such a state that in my judgment there was really no greater difference between my condition and that of the damned, except that in hell there is no redemption, while in mine it was still possible. One day, in order to get some respite, I cried out from the bottom of my heart, saying, quote, Oh, woe is me, that I have come to such a state, and woe to my soul which finds itself therein. Whither shall I turn, since all the portals of my salvation are closed? Unquote. Immediately a strong and sweet voice gave answer within myself, quote, Whither dost thou wish to go outside of God himself? Unquote. By this answer I perceived that my cure was at hand in the Lord, and at the breaking of this dawn I began to raise myself from the depth of the confusion into which I was cast, and I felt a powerful increase in the fervor of my desires and in the acts of faith, hope, and charity. I debased myself in the presence of the Most High, and in firm confidence in His goodness, I wept over my faults with bitter sorrow. I confessed them many times, and sighing from the depth of heart, I began to seek again the former light and truth. And as divine wisdom comes forth to meet those by whom it is invoked, wisdom 6, 17, it advanced toward me in delight, and cleared away the night of my confusion and tormenting afflictions. <coughs> <clears throat> the 
Presently, that bright, that bright day broke, which I had desired so much. The quiet possession of peace returned. I enjoyed the sweet love and vision of my Lord and Master, and with it I again perceived why I should believe, accept and esteem the benefits and favors which his mighty arm wrought in me. I gave him thanks as far as was in my power, and I saw who I was and who God is, that a creature by itself can do nothing, that it is nothing, because sin is nothing. I saw also what man can do when raised up and assisted by the divine right hand, being much more than can be imagined by our earthly faculties. Humbled in the perception of these truths and in the presence of the inaccessible light, which is vast and strong without deceit or falsehood, my heart flowed over in sweet affections of love, praise, and thanksgiving. For now I understood that he had guarded and defended me, so that in the confused night of temptations my lamp might not be extinguished. Proverbs 31, 18. And in the depth of my gratitude I annihilated myself to the dust and humiliated myself as a worm of the earth. To make this benefit more certain, I immediately heard an interior exhortation, without knowing clearly from whence it proceeded, while it severely reprehended me for my disloyalty and my wrongful ways, it at the same time admonished and enlightened, instructed and corrected me. It furnished me with a deep understanding of good and evil, of virtue and vice, of what was secure, useful and beneficial, as well as their co contraries. It laid open to me the way of eternity, gave me a knowledge of the means and of the end, of the value of life everlasting, and of the miserable unhappiness and the so little considered ruin of endless perdition. In the profound knowledge of these two extremes, I confess that I was dumbfounded and cast about between the fear of my dreadful infirmity and the desire of reaching the happiness of which I was unworthy on account of my demerits. I was full of the thought of the kindness and mercy of the Most High and the fear of losing Him. I beheld the two different ends awaiting the creatures, eternal glory and eternal misery, and it seemed a small matter to me to suffer all the pains and the torments of the world of purgatory and hell itself in order to attain to the one and to avoid the other and although i perceive that the divine help is assured to those who seek to make use of it yet as i also saw by this light that life and death are in our hands ecclesiastes fifteen eighteen and that our weakness or malice may prevent the proper use of grace and that the tree will lie for all eternity as it once has fallen Ecclesiastes 11.3. On this account I was overcome by the deepest sorrow which penetrated my heart. This sorrow was increased by a most severe answer or inquiry which came from the Lord. For while I found myself thus annihilated in the consciousness of my weakness and danger, and by the thought of having offended his justice, so that I, I dared not raise my eyes toward him, he met my speechless sorrow by the advances of his mercy, saying to me in answer to them, quote, Which dost thou wish, my soul? Which dost thou seek? Which of these ways wilt thou choose? What is thy resolve? This question was an arrow to my heart, for although I knew for certain that the Lord knew my desires better than I myself, the delay between the question and the answer was incredibly painful to me. I wished, if possible, that the Lord should anticipate my answer and should not show himself ignorant of the response which I would give. But, impelled by my, by my most great emotion, I made response in words coming from the innermost of soul, and said, quote, Lord and omnipotent God, the path of virtue, the way of eternal life do I choose. This do I desire, and in this do thou place me. And as I do not merit it in thy justice, I appeal to thy mercy. I offer for myself the infinite merits of thy most holy Son and my Redeemer, Jesus Christ, unquote. I was made aware that this highest judge remembered the promise which is given to the church that he would grant all that is asked in the name of his only begotten john sixteen twenty three and in him and on his account my petition was granted and its fulfillment hastened according to my poor wishes certain conditions were made and proposed to me by an intellectual voice saying to me interiorly quote, soul created by the hand of the almighty if thou wishest as one of the elect, to follow in the path of the, of the true light and attain the position of a most chaste spouse of the Lord, who calls thee, it is befitting that thou observe the laws and precepts of love. The first thing required of thee is that thou reject entirely all earthly inclinations, renouncing all and every affection toward the transient things, so that thou have no love or affection toward any created being, no matter how useful, beautiful, or agreeable it may appear to thee. 
Cherish no created image. Harbor no earthly affection. Let thy will rest in no created object, except in so far as thy Lord and spouse shall command thee for the well-ordering of thy love, or in so far as thou canst be aided thereby to love him alone. <coughs> Excuse me. And when after thus reaching this perfect abnegation and renunciation of thyself, thou shalt have freed and disentangled thyself from all earthly things, seek the Lord, raising thyself with the swift wings of the dove toward the high habitation in which he, in his condescension, wishes to place thy spirit, so that there may, thou mayest live, so that there thou mayest live in his presence and have a secure dwelling place. This great Lord is more is most jealous is a most jealous spouse, and his love and emulation are strong as death. Canticles 8, 6. He wishes to adorn thee, and set thee in a secure place, in order that thou mayest not issue from it, or leave his presence for another, where thou findest him not, or enjoyest not his caresses. He with whom thou art to converse without mistrust, wishes to sign thee with his own hand, and this is a most equitable law, which the spouses of the great king must observe. For even those in the world observe it in order to show their faithfulness it is due to the nobility of thy spouse that thou observe a behavior corresponding to the dignity and position conferred by him without descending to anything not befitting this estate or making thee unworthy of the adornment lavished upon thee for entrance into his bridal chamber next i require of thee that thou despoil thyself with diligence of the vestments torn by thy faults and imperfections soiled by the effects of sin and made odious by the inclinations of nature his majesty wishes to wash off the stains to purify and renew thee with his beauty but under condition that thou never lose sight of the poor and despicable vestments of which thou hast been divested so that in the memory and knowledge of this benefit thou mayest spread the odor of sweetness for this great king by the nard of thy humility canticles one eleven and so that thou mayest never forget the return which thou owest to the author of thy salvation. Thus he, thus will he, by the precious balsam of his blood, purify thee, heal thy wounds, and enlighten thee copiously. In addition to all this, this voice continued to say, in order that thus forgetting all earthly things thou mayest be coveted by the highest king, seek to adorn, th adorn thyself with the jewels which he in his pleasure has prepared for thee, the vestments which shall cover thee are to be whiter than snow, more brilliant than the diamond, more resplendent than the sun, and yet will be at the same time so delicate that they will easily be spoiled by any negligence, making thee abominable in the sight of thy spouse. But if thou preserve them in the purity which he desires, thy steps will be beautiful as the prince's daughter. Canticle 7.1 And his majesty will be pleased with thy sentiments and thy words. As a cincture of thy vestment, he will give thee the knowledge of his divine power and his holy fear, in order that, having bound thy inclinations, thou mayest direct thyself by his pleasure. The jewels of thy necklace, which adorn thy neck, signify thy humble submission, shall be the co signifying thy humble submission shall be the costly stones of faith, hope, and charity. As a clasp for thy hair, which are the high and exalted thoughts in thy heaven, and thy heavenly intelligences. Thou wilt have from him the infused science and wisdom, and the embroideries of thy vestment shall be all the beauty and richness of the virtues. Thy diligence in performing what is most perfect shall serve thee as sandals, and thy laces shall be the avoidance and restraints that thou wilt use in order to keep from evil. The rings which will beautify thy fingers shall be the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost, and the beauty of thy face shall be the participation of the divinity, which on account of his holy love shall shine their form therefrom thereto thou shalt add the coloring of confusion for having offended him in order that it may make thee ashamed of offending him in the future comparing at the same time the coarse and sordid habits of the past with those that now adorn thee and because thy own merits would make but a poor and miserable return for such a high espousal the most high wishes to ratify this contract by singling out as it if for thee alone the infinite merits of thy spouse jesus christ and he makes thee a partaker of all his possessions and treasures in the heavens and upon earth, for all belongs to this supreme Lord, Esther 13.11. And of all this thou shalt be mistress as his spouse, for thy own use and for the greater love of him. But remember, soul, that in order to obtain such a gift, 
Thou must hide all this within thyself, without ever losing thy secret. For I warn thee of the danger of soiling thy beauty with the least imperfection. But if at any time thou committest such an imperfection out of weakness, rise from it at once, like a strong one, and acknowledging it, weep over the small fault as if it had been the most grievous. And in order that thou mayest have a dwelling place and a habitation befitting such a great estate, thy spouse does not wish to set thee any limit, but it is his pleasure that thou dwellest in the infinite regions of his divinity, and that thou roam about and disport thyself through the illim illimitable fields of his attributes and perfections, where the view of the intellect is without restraint, where the will is delighted without shadow of misgiving, where and where the inclinations are satiated without bitterness. This is the paradise always delightful, where the most beloved brides of Christ find their recreation, where they gather the fragrant flowers and myrrh, and where the infinite is found for those that have renounced the imperfect nothing. There will thy, inhab there will thy habitation be secure, and in order that thy intercourse and companionship may be in correspondence with it, I desire that thou converse with the angels, holding them as friends and companions, and copying from them during their frequent conversations and intercourse with thee, their virtues by faithful imitation. Take notice, continued the voice, O soul of the greatness of this benefit, for the mother of thy spouse and the queen of heaven adopts thee anew for her daughter, receives thee as her disciple, and assumes the place of a mother and of a teacher toward thee. Through her intercession dost thou receive those special favors, and they are all granted to thee that thou mayest write her most holy life. On this account thou hast been pardoned without any, without thy merit, and that which otherwise thou wouldst not have reached has been conceded to thee. What would become of thee, O soul, if it were not for the mother of mercy? Thou wouldst already have perished if her intercession had failed thee. Poor and useless would have been thy works if, by divine condescension, thou hadst not been selected to write this history. But the Eternal Father chose thee for his daughter in view of this work, and for a spouse of his only begotten Son. And the Son received thee to his close embraces, and the Holy Spirit selected thee for his enlightenments. The document of this contract and espousal is written and imprinted on the white parchment of the purity of Most Holy Mary. There the finger and the power of the Most High have written it. The ink is the blood of the Lamb. The executor is the Eternal Father. The tie which binds thee to Christ is the Holy Spirit. The bondsmen are the merits of the same Jesus Christ and of his mother. For thou art but a vile worm, having nothing to offer, and being expected to give merely thy free consent. Unquote. So far the admonishing voice which I heard. Although I judged it to be that of an angel, yet whether such it was I could not ascertain clearly, for I did not perceive it in the same way as at other times. Such manifestations and disclosures accommodate themselves to the dispositions of the soul at the time of their reception, as, for instance, it happened to the disciples at Emmaus, Luke 24:16. Many other experiences I had in order to overcome the opposition of the serpent against the writing of this history, but it would draw out this introduction too much to mention them now. I continued my prayers for some days, asking the Lord to govern and direct me in order not to make a mistake and representing to him my incapacity and timidity. His majesty persisted in exhorting me <clears throat> to ordain my life toward all purity and the greatest perfection, and in urging me to continue in it after having begun. And especially the queen of the angels intimated to me her will many times, and with great sweetness and tenderness commanded me to obey her as her daughter, and write her most holy life, which I commenced, which I had commenced. To all this I wished to add the security of obedience. Without saying anything of that which I had heard from the Lord and from His Most Holy Mother, I asked my confessor and superior that he would direct me to do what to do in this matter. Direct me to do in this matter. What he would direct me to do in this matter. Sorry. He answered by commanding me under obedience to continue and to write the second part of this history. Finding myself thus compelled both by the Lord and by obedience, <clears throat> I returned again to the presence of the Most High, where I found myself one day in prayer, and renouncing my whole self and recognizing my insignificance and liability to err, I prostrated myself before His Majesty and said, quote, My Lord, my Lord, what wishest thou me, what wishest thou to do with me? Whereupon I re received the following intelligence. 
It seemed to me that the divine light of the blessed Trinity showed me my own self full of poverty and defects, and severely reprehending me for them, furnished me at the same time with the highest doctrine and salutary directions for a perfect life, and for this purpose God purified and enlightened me anew. I became aware that the Mother of Grace, Most Holy Mary, standing before the throne of the Divinity, was interceding and pleading for me. With such assistance, my confidence took new life, and profiting by the clemency of such a mother, I addressed myself to her, and spoke to her only these words, quote, My lady and my refuge, consider as, consider as a true mother the poverty of thy slave, unquote. It seemed to me as if she heard my prayer, and speaking with the Most High, she said, Quote, my Lord, I wish to receive this useless and poor creature anew as a daughter and adopt her as my own. Unquote. Truly, this was the act of a most liberal and mighty queen. But the Most High answered, quote, My spouse, for such a great favor as this, what does this soul bring in return? She does not deserve it, being a useless and destitute worm and thankless for our gifts. Unquote. A wonderful power of the divine word. How shall I describe the effects produced in me by this answer of the all-powerful? I humbled myself to the, to the depth of my nothingness, and I was filled with the knowledge of the misery of creatures and of my own ingratitude toward God. My heart sank within me in sorrow for my sins and in the desire of obtaining the unmerited happiness of being the child of that sovereign. I raised my eyes full of dread to the throne of the Most High, and my visage was transported in fear and hope. I turned toward my advocate, and desiring to be admitted as her slave, since I did not merit the title of daughter, I spoke from the bottom of my heart without forming any words, and I heard the great lady say to the Lord, quote, Divine Lord and my God, it is true, this poor creature has nothing to offer thy justice, but I offer for her the merits and the blood which my most holy son poured out for her, and with it I present also the dignity of mother of thy only begotten son, which I received from thy ineffable kindness, all the works which I performed in thy service in having borne him in my womb and nourished him with the milk of my breast, and above all I offer thee thy own bounty and divinity. I earnestly entreat thee to consider this creature as my adopted daughter and disciple for whom I will stand security. Under my guidance she will amend her faults and perform her works according to thy pleasure." Unquote. The Most High, may he be eternally praised for hearing the petition of the Great Queen interceding for the least of his creatures, yielded to these prayers, and immediately, in the joy of my soul, I felt immense effects, such as are impossible to describe. With my whole heart I turned toward all the creatures of heaven and earth, and not being able to contain my exultation, I invited them to exalt for me and with me the author of grace. It seemed to me that I addressed them in the following words, quote, O ye inhabitants and courtiers of heaven and all ye living creatures, formed by the hand of the Most High, behold this marvel of his liberality and mercy, and bless and exalt him for all eternity, since he has raised from the dust the most vile of the universe and has enriched the most destitute. He has honored the most unworthy, though he is the highest God and the powerful King, and since you, sons of Adam, here see the poorest orphans succored, the greatest sinner pardoned, issue forth from your ignorance, Raise yourself from your listlessness, and renew your hope. For if his powerful arm has assisted me, if he has called and forgiven me, all of you can hope for your salvation. And if you wish to assure yourselves of it, seek, seek the protection of the Most Holy Mary, ask her for intercession, and you will find her to be the mother of ineffable mercy and clemency." Unquote. I turned also to this most exalted queen and said to her, quote, I, O oh my lady, now I do not call myself an orphan, since I have a mother, and a mother who is, in, who is the queen of all creation. I shall not any more be ignorant, since I have as teacher the mistress of divine wisdom. Not poor, since I have as Lord him who is master of all the treasures of heaven and earth. I have a mother who protects me, an instructress who teaches and corrects me, a mistress who commands and governs me. Blessed art thou amongst all women, wonderful among all creatures, admirable in heaven and on earth, and let all confess thy greatness with eternal praises, since it is not an, not easy or possible for the least among creatures, the lowest worm of the earth, to give thee any return. Receive it then from the divine right hand and in the divine vision, where thou standest in the presence of God, enjoying thyself through all eternity. I shall remain thy acknowledged and bounden slave, 
praising the Almighty as long as my life shall last, since his liberal mercy has so favored me as to give me my queen as my mother and teacher. Let my loving muteness praise thee, since my tongue has not words or terms adequate for doing it, for all of them are strained and limited." <clears throat> It is not possible to describe what the soul feels during such mysterious favors. <clears throat> I think my cat is snoring. Sorry, Lord. They were the source of great good to my soul, for immediately I was made aware of the perfection of life and of works for which I failed to find terms. But all this, the Most High told me, was given to me on account of the Most Holy Mary and in order to write her life. It was intimated to me that by ratifying this blessing, the Eternal Father chose me to manifest the sacraments of his daughter, that the Holy Spirit poured out his light and inspirations, that I might declare the hidden gifts of his spouse, and that the Most Holy Son appointed me to manifest the mysteries of his most pure mother, Mary. And in order that I might become capable of this work, the Holy Trinity enlightened and bathed my soul in a special light of the divinity, and the divine power touched up my faculties, as with a pencil, furnishing them with new habits for the perfection for the perfect execution of this work. The Most High also commanded me to strive to imitate with all my heart, according to my weak powers, all that I should understand and write about the heroic virtues and the most holy operations of the Heavenly Queen, guiding my life according to her example. Knowing how unfit I am for the fulfillment of this obligation, the same Most Kind Queen offered to me anew her favor, help, and instruction, for all that the Lord commanded and pointed out to me. Then I asked for the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity in order to begin the second part of this heavenly history. I felt that all these, per all three persons of the Godhead conferred their blessing upon me. Issuing from the trance, I sought to wash my soul in the sacraments, and full of contrition for my sins, in the name of the Lord and of obedience, I set myself about this work for the glory of the Most High and for His Most Holy Mother, the Ever-Immaculate Virgin Mary. <coughs> This second part comprises the life of the Queen of the Angels from the mystery of the Incarnation to the Ascension of Christ our Lord into Heaven, which is the principal and the most important part of this history, for it includes the whole life and mysteries of the Lord Himself with His Passion and Most Holy Death. I wish only to remark here that the graces and blessings conceded to Most Holy Mary in preparation for the Incarnation began to flow from the moment of her Immaculate Conception, already at that time in the intention and the decree of God, she was the mother of the word. But in the measure as the realization of the incarnation drew nigh, the favors and gifts of graces continued to increase. In gift of grace continued to increase. Although they seemed to be all of the same kind in nature from the beginning, yet they continued to augment and increase. And there are not terms new and varied enough to equal in their significance these increases and advances in the blessings conferred. Thus, it became necessary in this narrative to measure all by the infinite power of the Lord, who giving much retains enough to give infinitely more, while the capacity of each soul, and especially the soul of the Queen of Heaven, is in its way infinite, being able to receive ever more and more. And this happened with the soul of Holy Mary, until she arrived at a summit of holiness and participation of the divinity, to which no other creature has attained, nor will ever attain in all eternity. May the Lord himself enlighten me, and I may follow up this work according to his divine pleasure. Amen. Okay, Book 1, Part 3, First Part of the Second Part. Contains the most exquisite preparations of the Almighty for the incarnation of the Word in Mary Most Holy, the circumstances accompanying this mystery, the exalted state in which the Blessed Mother was placed, her visit to, the, to St. Elizabeth and the sanctification of the Baptist, her return to Nazareth, and a memorable battle of the Virgin with Lucifer. And I'm going to go ahead and start this. I've got about ten minutes. The Most High begins to prepare in Most Holy Mary the mystery of the Incarnation, the events of the nine days preceding the, this mystery, especially the happenings of the first day. In order that her most faultless life might be to all an example of the highest holiness, the Most High had, had placed upon our Queen and Mistress the duties of a spouse of St. Joseph, 
which was a position requiring more intercourse with her neighbors. The heavenly mistress, finding herself in this new estate, was filled with such exalted thoughts and sentiments in the fulfillment of her duties and ordered all the activities of her life with such wisdom that she was an object of admirable emulation to the angelic spirits and an unparalleled example for men. Few knew her and still fewer had spoken with her, but these happy ones were so filled with that celestial influence of Mary that with a wonderful joy and with unwanted flights of spirit they sought to express and manifest the light which illumined their hearts and which they knew came from her. The most prudent queen was not unaware of these operations of the Most High, but neither was it yet time, nor would her most profound humility as yet consent to their becoming known to the world. She continually besought the Lord to hide them from men, to make all the favors of his right hand redound solely to his praise, and to permit her to be ignored and despised by all the mortals, in as far as his infinite goodness would not be offended thereby. These prayers were accepted by her divine spouse with great benignity, and his providence arranged all things in such, in such a manner that the very light which incited men to proclaim her greatness at the same time caused them to be mute. Moved by divine power, they refrained from expressing their thoughts, inwardly praising the Lord for the light which they felt within themselves. <laughs> Filled with marvel, they suspended their judgment, and leaving behind the creatures, they sought their Creator. Many turned from sin at the mere sight of her. Others amended their lives. All were affected at seeing her and experienced heavenly influences in their souls. But immediately they forgot the source of these influences, for if they could have remained in her presence or could have retained the memory of her image, and if God had not prevented it by a mystery, nothing would have been able to divert their attention from her, and all would have sought her without wavering. In such fruitful occupations and in the augmenting, and in augmenting the gifts and graces from which all this good proceeded, our queen, the spouse of Joseph, busied herself during the six months and seventeen days which intervened between her espousal and the incarnation of the word. I cannot pretend to refer even briefly to her great heroic acts of all the virtues, interior and exterior, to all her deeds of charity, humility, religion, and all her works of mercy, the alms, the benef benefactions, for this exceeds the power of the pen. The best I can do is to sum up and say that the Most High found in Most Holy Mary the fulfillment of all his pleasure and of his wishes as far as is possible in the correspondence of a creature with its creator. By her sanctity and merits, God felt himself as it were obliged and, according to our way of speaking, compelled to hasten his steps and extend the arms of his omnipotence to bring about the greatest of wonders conceivable in the world before or after namely, the incarnation of the only begotten of the Father in the virginal womb of this lady. In order to proceed with a dignity befitting himself, God prepared Most Holy Mary in a singular manner during the nine days immediately preceding this mystery and allowed the river of his divinity to rush impetuously forth, Psalm 45.5, to inundate this city of God with its floods. He communicated such great graces and gifts and favors that I am struck dumb by the perception of what has been made known to me concerning this miracle, and my lowliness is filled with dread at even the mention of what I understood. For the tongue, the pen, and all the faculties of a creature fall far below any possibility of revealing such incomprehensible sacraments. Therefore I wish it to be understood that all I say here is only an insignificant shadow of the smallest part of these wonders and ineffable prodigies, which are not at all to be encompassed by our limited words, but only by the power divine which I do not possess. On the first day of this most blessed novena, the heavenly Princess Mary, after a slight rest, according to the example of her father David, and according to the D-I-U-R-N-A-L, di di I don't know how to pronounce that, order, an arrangement laid out for her, by the Lord, left her couch at midnight, Psalm 118, 62, and prostrated in the presence of the Most High, commenced her accustomed prayer and holy exercises. The angels who attended upon her spoke to her and said, quote, Spouse of our King and Lord, arise, for His Majesty calls thee, unquote. She raised herself with fervent affection and answered, quote, The Lord commands the dust to raise itself from the dust, unquote. And turning toward the countenance of the Lord who called her, she added, quote, Most high and powerful master, what wishest thou to do with me? 
unquote. At these words, her most holy soul was raised in spirit to a new and higher habitation, closer to the same Lord and more remote from all earthly and passing things. She felt at once that she was being prepared by those illuminations and purification, purifications which at other times she had experienced in some of the most exalted visions of the divinity. I do not dwell on them, since I have described them in the first part. The divinity manifested itself not by an intuitive, but by an abstractive vision, however so clearly, that by it she understood more of this incomprehensible object than what the blessed see and enjoy by intuition. For this vision was more exalted and more, more profound than the others of that kind, since this heavenly lady made herself more capable day by day, and because she made such perfect use of graces, she disposed herself for ever greater ones. Moreover, she repeated enlightenments and visions of the divinity, continually enabling her to respond more and more befittingly to its infinite operations. In this vision, our Princess Mary learned most high secrets of the divinity and of its perfections, and especially of God's communications ad extra in the work of creation. She saw that it originated in the goodness and liberality of God, that creatures were not necessary for supplementing his divine existence, nor for his infinite glory, since without them he was glorious through the interminable, interminable eternities before the creation of the world. Many sacraments and secrets were manifested to our queen, which neither can nor should be made known to all, for she alone was the only one. Canticles 6, 8, 7, 6. The Chosen One, selected by the highest King and Lord of creation for these delights. But as Her Highness in this vision perceived and this impulse and inclination of the divinity to communicate itself ad extra with a force of greater than that which makes all the elements tend toward their center, and as she was drawn within the sphere of this divine love, she besought the Eternal Father with heart aflame that He send His only begotten into the world and give salvation to men, since in this manner He should satisfy, and speaking humanly, execute the promptings of His divinity and its perfections. These petitions of his spouse were very sweet to the Lord. They were the scarlet lace with which she bound and secured his love, and in order to put his desires into execution he sought first to prepare the tabernacle or temple, whither he was to, to descend from the bosom of the Eternal Father. He resolved to furnish his beloved and chosen mother with a clear knowledge of all his works ad extra, just as his omnipotence had made them. On the first day, therefore, and in the same vision he manifested to her all that he had made on the first day of the creation of the world, as it is recorded in Genesis, and she perceived all with greater clearness and comprehension than if she had been an eyewitness, for she knew them first as they are in God, and then as they are in themselves. She perceived and understood how the Lord in the beginning, Genesis 1, 1, 5, created heaven and earth, in how far and in what way it was void, and how the darkness was over the face of the abyss, how the Spirit of the Lord hovered over the waters, and how, at the divine command, light was made, and what was its nature, how, after the darkness was divided, it was called night and the light day, and how thus the first day was made. She knew the size of the earth, its longitude, latitude, and depth, its caverns, hell, limbo, and purgatory with their inhabitants, the countries, climes, the meridians, the divisions, and divisions of the world, and all its inhabitants and occupants. With the same cleverness, she knew clearness. With the same clearness, clearness, she knew the inferior orbs in the Empyrean heaven, how the angels were made on the first day. She was informed of their nature, conditions, diversity, hierarchies, offices, grades, and virtues. The rebellion of the bad angels was revealed to her, their fall and the occasion of the cause of that fall, though the Lord always concealed from her that which concerned herself. She understood the punishment and the effects of sin in the demons, beholding them as they are in themselves, and at the conclusion of the first day, the Lord showed to her how she too was formed of this lowly earthly material and endowed with the same nature as all those who returned to the dust. He did not, however, say that she would again return to it, Yet he gave her such a profound knowledge of the earthly existence that the great queen humiliated herself to the abyss of nothingness. Being without fault, she debased herself more than all the children of Adam with all their miseries. All praise and glory be to our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, forever and ever.
Amen. May God bless and keep you.